the polity of the athenians and the lacedaemonians this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phil chenever baton rouge louisiana the polity of the athenians by xenophon translated by h g dakins part one now as concerning the polity of the athenians and the type or manner of constitution which they have chosen i praise it not in so far as the very choice involves the welfare of the baser folk as opposed to that of the better class i repeat i withhold my praise so far but given the fact that this is the type agreed upon i propose to show that they set about its preservation in the right way and that those other transactions in connection with it which are looked upon as blunders by the rest of the hellenic world are the reverse in the first place i maintain it is only just that the poorer classes and the people of athens should be better off than the men of birth and wealth seeing that it is the people who man the fleet and put round the city her girdle of power the steersman the boatswain the lieutenant the lookout man at the prow the shipwright these are the people who ingird the city with power far rather than her heavy infantry and men of birth of quality this being the case it seems only just that offices of state should be thrown open to every one both in the ballot and the show of hands and that the right of speech should belong to any one who likes without restriction for observe there are many of these offices which according as they are in good or bad hands are a source of safety or of danger to the people and in these the people prudently abstains from sharing for instance it does not think it incumbent on itself to share in the functions of the general or of the commander of cavalry the sovereign people recognizes the fact that in foregoing the personal exercise of these offices and leaving them in the control of the more powerful citizens it secures the balance of advantage to itself it is only those departments of government which bring emolument and assist the private estate that the people care to keep in its own hands in the next place in regard to what some people are puzzled to explain the fact that everywhere greater consideration is shown to the base to poor people and to common folk than to persons of good quality so far from being a matter of surprise this as can be shown is the keystone of the preservation of the democracy it is these poor people this common folk this riffraff whose prosperity combined with the growth of their numbers enhances the democracy whereas the shifting of fortune to the advantage of the wealthy and the better classes implies the establishment on the part of the commonality of a strong power in opposition to itself in fact all the world over the cream of society is in opposition to the democracy naturally since the smallest amount of intemperance and injustice together with the highest scrupulousness in the pursuit of excellence is to be found in the ranks of the better class while within the ranks of the people will be found the greatest amount of ignorance disorderliness rascality poverty acting as a stronger incentive to base conduct not to speak of lack of education and ignorance traceable to the lack of means which afflict the average of mankind the objection may be raised that it was a mistake to allow the universal right of speech and a seat in council these should have been reserved for the cleverest the flower of the community but here again it will be found that they are acting with wise deliberation in granting to even the baser sort the right of speech for supposing only the better people might speak or sit in council blessings would fall to the lot of those like themselves but to the commonality the reverse of blessings 
whereas now any one who likes any base fellow may get up and discover something to the advantage of himself and his equals it may be retorted and what sort of advantage either for himself or for the people can such a fellow be expected to hit upon the answer to which is that in their judgment the ignorance and baseness of this fellow together with his good will are worth a great deal more to them than your superior person's virtue and wisdom coupled with animosity what it comes to therefore is that a state founded upon such institutions will not be the best state but given a democracy these are the right means to procure its preservation the people it must be borne in mind does not demand that the city should be well governed and itself a slave it desires to be free and to be master as to bad legislation it does not concern itself about that in fact what you believe to be bad legislation is the very source of the people's strength and freedom but if you seek for good legislation in the first place you will see the cleverest members of the community laying down the laws for the rest and in the next place the better class will curb and chastise the lower orders the better class will deliberate in behalf of the state and not suffer crack-brained fellows to sit in council or to speak or vote in parliament no doubt but under the weight of such blessings the people will in a very short time be reduced to slavery another point is the extraordinary amount of license granted to slaves and resident aliens at athens where a blow is illegal and a slave will not step aside to let you pass him in the street i will explain the reason for this peculiar custom supposing it were legal for a slave to be beaten by a free citizen or for a resident alien or freed man to be beaten by a citizen it would frequently happen that an athenian might be mistaken for a slave or an alien and receive a beating since the athenian people is no better clothed than the slave or alien nor in personal appearance is there any superiority or if the fact itself that slaves in athens are allowed to indulge in luxury and indeed in some cases to live magnificently be found astonishing this too it can be shown is done of set purpose where you have a naval power dependent upon wealth we must perforce be slaves to our slaves in order that we may get in our slave rents and let the real slave go free where you have wealthy slaves it ceases to be advantageous that my slave should stand in awe of you in lacedaemon my slave stands in awe of you but if your slave is in awe of me there will be a risk of his giving away his own monies to avoid running a risk in his own person it is for this reason then that we have established an equality between our slaves and freemen and again between our resident aliens and full citizens because the city stands in need of her resident aliens to meet the requirements of such a multiplicity of arts and for the purposes of her navy that is i repeat the justification for the equality conferred upon our resident aliens citizens devoting their time to gymnastics and to the cultivation of music are not to be found in athens the sovereign people have disestablished them not from any disbelief in the beauty and honor of such training but recognizing the fact that these are things the cultivation of which is beyond its power on the same principle in the case of corrigia the gymnasiarchy and the triarchy the fact is recognized that it is the rich man who trains the chorus and the people for whom the chorus is trained it is the rich man who is triarch or gymnasiarch and the people that profits by their labors in fact what the people look upon as its right is to pocket the money to sing and run and dance and man the vessels is well enough but only in order that the people may be the gainer while the rich are made poorer and so in the course of justice 
justice is not more an object of concern to the jurymen than what touches personal advantage to speak next of the allies and in reference to the point that emissaries from athens come out and according to common opinion calumnate and vent their hatred upon the better sort of the people this is done on the principle that the ruler cannot help being hated by those whom he rules but that if wealth and respectability are to wield power in the subject cities the empire of the athenian people has but a short lease of existence this explains why the better people are punished with infamy robbed of their money driven from their homes and put to death while the baser sort are promoted to honor on the other hand the better athenians throw their aegis over the better class in the allied cities and why because they recognize that it is to the interest of their own class at all times to protect the best element in the cities it may be urged that if it comes to strength and power the real strength of athens lies in the capacity of her allies to contribute their money quota but to the democratic mind it appears a higher advantage still for the individual athenian to get hold of the wealth of the allies leaving them only enough to live upon and to cultivate their estates but powerless to harbor treacherous designs again it is looked upon as a mistaken policy on the part of the athenian democracy to compel her allies to voyage to athens in order to have their cases tried on the other hand it is easy to reckon up what a number of advantages the athenian people derive from the practice impugned in the first place there is the steady receipt of salaries throughout the year derived from the court fees next it enables them to manage their affairs of the allied states while seated at home without the expense of naval expeditions thirdly they thus preserve the partisans of the democracy and ruin her opponents in the law courts whereas supposing the several allied states tried their cases at home being inspired by hostility to athens they would destroy those of their own citizens whose friendship to the athenian people was most marked but besides all this the democracy derives the following advantages from hearing the cases of her allies in athens in the first place the one per cent levied in piraeus is increased to the profit of the state again the owner of a lodging house does better and so too the owner of a pair of beasts or of slaves to be let out on hire again heralds and criers are a class of people who fare better owing to the sojourn of foreigners at athens further still supposing the allies had not to resort to athens for the hearing of cases only the official representative of the imperial state would be held in honor such as the general or tetrarch or ambassador whereas now every single individual among the allies is forced to pay flattery to the people of athens because he knows that he must betake himself to athens and win or lose his case at the bar not of any stray set of judges but of the sovereign people itself such being the law and custom at athens he is compelled to behave as a suppliant in the courts of justice and when some juryman comes into court to grasp his hand for this reason therefore the allies find themselves more and more in the position of slaves to the people of athens furthermore owing to the possession of property beyond the limits of attica and the exercise of magistracies which take them into regions beyond the frontier they and their attendants have insensibly acquired the art of navigation a man who is perpetually voyaging is forced to handle the oar he and his domestics alike and to learn the terms familiar in seamanship hence a stock of skillful mariners is produced bred upon a wide experience of voyaging and practice they have learnt their business some in piloting a small craft others a merchant vessel 
while others have been drafted off from these for service on a ship of war so that the majority of them are now able to row the moment they set foot on board a vessel having been in a state of preliminary practice all their lives part two as to the heavy infantry an arm the deficiency of which at athens is well recognized this is how the matter stands they recognize the fact that in reference to the hostile power they are themselves inferior and must be even if their heavy infantry were more numerous but relative to the allies who bring in the tribute their strength even on land is enormous and they are persuaded that their heavy infantry is sufficient for all purposes provided they retain this superiority apart from all else to a certain extent fortune must be held responsible for the actual condition the subjects of a power which is dominant on land have it open to them to form contingents from several small states and to muster in force for battle but with the subjects of a naval power it is different as far as they are groups of islanders it is impossible for their states to meet together for united action for the sea lies between them and the dominant power is master of the sea even if it were possible for them to assemble in some single island unobserved they would only do so to perish by famine and as to the states subject to athens which are not islanders but situated on the continent the larger are held in check by need and the small ones absolutely by fear since there is no state in existence which does not depend upon imports and exports and these she will forfeit if she does not lend a willing ear to those who are masters by sea in the next place a power dominant by sea can do certain things which a land power is debarred from doing as for instance ravage the territory of a superior since it is always possible to coast along to some point where either there is no hostile force to deal with or merely a small body and in case of an advance in force on the part of the enemy they can take to their ships and sail away such a performance is attended with less difficulty than that experienced by the relieving force on land again it is open to a power so dominating by sea to leave its own territory and sail off on as long a voyage as you please whereas the land power cannot place more than a few days journey between itself and its own territory for marches are slow affairs and it is not possible for an army on the march to have food supplies to last for any great length of time such an army must either march through friendly territory or it must force a way by victory in battle the voyager meanwhile has it in his power to disembark at any point where he finds himself in superior force or at the worst to coast by until he reaches either a friendly district or an enemy too weak to resist again those diseases to which the fruits of the earth are liable as visitations from heaven fall severely on a land power but are scarcely felt by the naval power for such sicknesses do not visit the whole earth everywhere at once so that the ruler of the sea can get in supplies from a thriving district and if one may descend to more trifling particulars it is to this same large ship of the sea that the athenians owe the discovery in the first place of many of the luxuries of life through intercourse with other countries so that the choice of things of sicily and italy of cyprus and egypt and lydia of pontus or peloponnese or wheresoever else it be all are swept as it were into one centre and all owing as i say to their maritime empire and again in process of listening to every form of speech they have selected this from one place and that from another for themselves so much so that while the rest of the hellenes employ each pretty much their own peculiar mode of speech habit of life and style of dress the athenians have adopted a composite type to which all sections of hellas and the foreigner alike have contributed 
as regards sacrifices and temples and festivals and sacred enclosures the people sees that it is not possible for every poor citizen to do sacrifice and hold festival or to set up temples and to inhabit a large and beautiful city but it has hit upon a means of meeting the difficulty they sacrifice that is the whole state sacrifices at the public cost a large number of victims but it is the people that keeps holiday and distributes the victims by lot amongst its members rich men may have in some cases private gymnasia and baths with dressing rooms but the people takes care to have built at the public cost a number of palestras dressing rooms and bathing establishments for its own special use and the mob gets the benefit of the majority of these rather than the select few or the well-to-do as to wealth the athenians are exceptionally placed with regard to hellenic and foreign communities alike in their ability to hold it for given that some state or other is rich in timber for shipbuilding where is it to find a market for the product except by persuading the ruler of the sea or suppose the wealth of some state or other to consist of iron or may be of bronze or of linen yarn where will it find a market except by permission of the supreme maritime power yet these are the very things you see which i need for my ships timber i must have from one and from another iron from a third bronze and from a fourth yarn from a fifth wax etc besides which they will not suffer their antagonists in these parts to carry these products elsewhither or they will cease to use the sea accordingly i without one stroke of labor extract from the land and possess all these good things thanks to my supremacy on the sea whilst not a single other state possesses the two of them not timber for instance and yarn together the same city but where yarn is abundant the soil will be light and devoid of timber and in the same way bronze and iron will not be products of the same city and so for the rest never two or at best three in one state but one thing here and another thing there moreover above and beyond what has been said the coastline of every mainland presents either some jutting promontory or adjacent island or narrow strait of some sort so that those who are masters of the sea can come to moorings at one of these points and wreak vengeance on the inhabitants of the mainland there is just one thing which the athenians lack supposing that they were the inhabitants of an island and were still as now rulers of the sea they would have it in their power to work whatever mischief they liked and to suffer no evil in return as long as they kept command of the sea neither the ravaging of their territory nor the expectation of an enemy's approach whereas at present the farming portion of the community and the wealthy landowners are ready to cringe before the enemy overmuch whilst the people knowing full well come what may not one stock or stone of their property will suffer nothing will be cut down nothing burnt lives in freedom from alarm without fawning at the enemy's approach besides this there is another fear from which they would have been exempt in an island home the apprehension of the city being at any time betrayed by their oligarchs and the gates thrown open and an enemy bursting suddenly in how could incidents like these have taken place if an island had been their home again had they inhabited an island there would have been no stirring of sedition against the people whereas at present in the event of faction those who set it in foot base their hopes of success on an introduction of an enemy by land but a people inhabiting an island would be free from all anxiety on that score since however they did not chance to inhabit an island from the first what they now do is this they deposit their property in the islands trusting to their command of the sea and they suffer the soil of attica to be ravaged without a sigh to extend pity on that they know 
would be to deprive themselves of other blessings still more precious further states oligarchically governed are forced to ratify their alliances and solemn oaths and if they fail to abide by their contracts the offence by whomsoever committed lies nominally at the door of the oligarchs who entered upon the contract but in the case of engagements entered into by a democracy it is open to the people to throw the blame on the single individual who spoke in favor of some measure or put it to the vote and to maintain to the rest of the world i was not present nor do i approve of the terms of the agreement inquiries are made in a full meeting of the people and should any of these things be disapproved of he can at once discover ten thousand excuses to avoid doing whatever they do not wish and if any mischief should spring out of any resolutions which the people has passed in council the people can readily shift the blame from its own shoulders a handful of oligarchs acting against the interests of the people have ruined us but if any good result ensue they the people at once take the credit of that to themselves in the same spirit it is not allowed to caricature on the comic stage or otherwise libel the people because they do not care to hear themselves ill spoken of but if any one has a desire to satirize his neighbor he has full leave to do so and this because they are well aware that as a general rule the person caricatured does not belong to the people or the masses he is more likely to be some wealthy or well-born person or man of means and influence in fact few poor people and of the popular stamp incur the comic lash or if they do they have brought it on themselves by excessive love of meddling or some such covetous self-seeking at the expense of the people so that no particular annoyance is felt at seeing such folk satirized what then i venture to assert is that the people of athens has no difficulty in recognizing which of its citizens are of the better sort and which the opposite and so recognizing those who are serviceable and advantageous to itself even though they be base the people loves them but the good folk they are disposed rather to hate this virtue of theirs the people holds is not ingrained in their nature for any good to itself but rather for its injury in direct opposition to this there are some persons who being born of the people are yet by natural instinct not commoners for my part i pardon the people its own democracy as indeed it is pardonable to any one to do good to himself but the man who not being himself one of the people prefers to live in a state democratically governed rather than in an oligarchical state may be said to smooth his own path towards iniquity he knows that a bad man has a better chance of slipping through the fingers of justice in a democracy than in an oligarchical state part three i repeat that my position concerning the polity of the athenians is this the type of polity is not to my taste but given that a democratic form of government has been agreed upon they do seem to me to go the right way to preserve the democracy by the adoption of the particular type which i have set forth but there are other objections brought as i am aware against the athenians by certain people and to this effect it not seldom happens they tell us that a man is unable to transact a piece of business with the senate or the people even if he sit waiting a whole year now this does happen at athens and for no other reason save that owing to the immense mass of affairs they are unable to work off all the business at hand and dismiss the applicants and how in the world should they be able considering in the first place that they the athenians have more festivals to celebrate than any other state throughout the length and breadth of hellas during these festivals of course the transaction of any sort of affairs of state is still more out of the question 
In the next place, only consider the number of cases they have to decide. What with private suits and public causes and scrutinies of accounts, etc., more than the whole of the rest of mankind put together. While the Senate has multifarious points to advise upon concerning peace and war, concerning ways and means, concerning the framing and passing of laws, and concerning the thousand and one matters affecting the state perpetually occurring, and endless questions touching the allies, besides the receipt of the tribute, the superintendency of dockyards and temples, etc., can, I ask again, any one find it at all surprising that, with all these affairs on their hands, they are unequal to doing business with all the world? But some people tell us that if the applicant will only address himself to the Senate or the people with a fee in his hand, he will do a good stroke of business. And for my part I am free to confess to these gainsayers that a good many things may be done at Athens by dint of money, and I will add that a good many more still might be done if the money flowed still more freely and from more pockets. One thing, however, I know full well that as to transacting with every one of these applicants all he wants, the state could not do it, not even if all the gold and silver in the world were the inducement offered. Here are some of the cases which have to be decided on. Someone fails to fit out a ship. Judgment must be given. Another puts up a building on a piece of public land. Again, judgment must be given. Or, to take another class of cases, adjudication has to be made between the Karaji for the Dionysia, the Thargelia, the Panathenia, year after year. And again, in behalf of the Gymnasiarchs, a similar adjudication for the Panathenia, the Promethenia, and the Hepestia, also year after year. Also, as between the Tetrarchs, four hundred of whom are appointed each year, of these two, any who may choose must have their cases adjudicated on year after year. But that is not all. There are various magistrates to examine and approve and decide between. There are orphans whose status must be examined, and guardians of prisoners to appoint. These, be it borne in mind, are all matters of yearly occurrence, while at intervals there are exceptions and abstentions from military service which call for adjudication, or in connection with some other extraordinary misdemeanor, some case of outrage and violence of an exceptional character, or some charge of impiety. A whole string of others I simply omit. I am content to have named the most important part with the exception of the assessments of tribute which occur as a rule at intervals of five years. I put it to you, then, can any one suppose that all or any of these may dispense with adjudication? If so, will any one say which ought and which ought not to be adjudicated on there and then? If, on the other hand, we are forced to admit that these are all fair cases for adjudication, it follows of necessity that they should be decided during the twelve month, since even now the boards of judges sitting right through the year are powerless to stay the tide of evil doing by reason of the multitude of the people. So far, so good. But, someone will say, try the cases you certainly must, but lessen the number of the judges. But if so, it follows of necessity that unless the number of courts themselves are diminished in number, there will only be a few judges sitting in each court, with the further consequence that, in dealing with so small a body of judges, it will be easier for a litigant to present an invulnerable front to the court and to bribe the whole body to the great detriment of justice. But besides this, we cannot escape the conclusion that the Athenians have their festivals to keep during which the courts cannot sit. As a matter of fact, these festivals are twice as numerous as those of any other people, but I will reckon them as merely equal to those of the state which has the fewest. This being so, 
I maintain that it is not possible for business affairs at Athens to stand on any very different footing from the present, except to some slight extent, by adding here and deducting there. Any large modification is out of the question, short of damaging the democracy itself. No doubt many expedients might be discovered for improving the Constitution, but if the problem be to discover some adequate means of improving the Constitution, while at the same time the democracy is to remain intact? I say it is not easy to do this, except, as I have just stated, to the extent of some trifling addition here or deduction there. There is another point in which it is sometimes felt that the Athenians are ill-advised, in their adoption, namely, of the less respectable party in a state divided by faction. But if so, they do it advisedly. If they chose the more respectable, they would be adopting those whose views and interests differ from their own, for there is no state in which the best element is friendly to the people. It is the worst element which in every state favors the democracy, on the principle that like favors like. It is simple enough, then. The Athenians choose what is most akin to themselves. Also, on every occasion on which they have attempted to side with the better classes, it has not fared well with them, but within a short interval the Democratic Party has been enslaved, as, for instance, in Boethia, or as when they chose the aristocrats of the Milicians, and within a short time these revolted and cut the people to pieces, or when they chose the Lacedaemonians, as against the Messenians, and within a short time the Lacedaemonians subjugated the Messenians and went to war against Athens. I seem to overhear a retort. No one, of course, is deprived of his civil rights at Athens unjustly. My answer is that there are some who are unjustly deprived of their civil rights, though the cases are certainly rare. But it will take more than a few to attack the democracy at Athens, since you may take it as an established fact. It is not the man who has lost his civil rights justly that takes the matter to heart, but the victims, if any, of injustice. But how in the world can anyone imagine that many are in a state of civil disability at Athens, where the people and the holders of office are one and the same? It is from iniquitous exercise of office, from iniquity exhibited either in speech or action, and the like circumstances, that citizens are punished with deprivation of civil rights in Athens. Due reflection on these matters will serve to dispel the notion that there is any danger at Athens from persons visited with disenfranchisement. End of The Polity of the Athenians by Xenophon